Greetings and a little bit of extra sound and all you lovely people viewers. Welcome back to another episode of Geek Unlock. We're rolling back into a little bit of global power rankings today. We kind of had a week off from doing these. You had the EWC, which kind of threw things for a little bit of a loop. So there's going to be some somewhat large moves for a couple of squads because it's basically been two weeks, even though. LCS teams haven't really played. LEC teams have only played a little bit, uh, but mostly the LPL. Um, obviously, some big changes as they transitioned into that rumble stage, little bit of action, and with LEC playoffs kicking off, already a pair of best of threes for most of the squads on this list, not most all of the squads on this list, which is almost as many games as they played in the regular season, which means, yes, plenty of opportunity for moving up, down, sideways, every way you can imagine on this list as we go 20 to 1. And we begin with a team returning to the top 20. I actually don't know if they made it in summer split, but it's Weibo Gaming, who are still trying to shed the fraud allegations, barely getting into this winner's bracket uh, of Ascension in Group A. But la lately, after a win against NIP, you're actually feeling okay, at the very least, about Weibo deserving to get onto this list. Tarzan looking much better. Zhao Hu thriving when you can play these 80 carry mids. Remember, Tristana and Lucian, some of his go-to picks when he had roll swap to the top lane. He's looked much more comfortable on those. Tarzan is doing not 600 damage in a game, and mainly Light is getting some help around him. So not only did they beat NIP in their last matchup, nearly perfect gamed them in one of those matchups that first game. So actually a dominant win, which is not something we've seen, even when they've upset some of the better teams. Uh, they've got this combined with the win against uh, JDG, JDG, I believe, uh, their first win. So maybe climbing only higher as time goes on. They're right alongside a squad that we also felt terrible about times in this summer split. But KT Rolster now four series wins in a row to get back to 500 overall. Feeling much better about Deft, Barrel, and the gang. Piosic has been the standout for me uh, during... This four-game win streak, we know when the boy gets Viego, he's going to have a fun time. But now his pocket pick has kind of expanded, and he's looking good on some of these AP junglers as well. KT finally and slowly returning back to that perennial, not just playoff team, this is a squad that, again, we wanted to be in that conversation of top four, maybe top three, vying against the boys on D plus Kia and Hanwha Life as that kind of tier below both T1 and Gen G. Haven't gotten to that point yet, but at least they're here. At least they're not getting bumped out of the top 20 after the first week we bring them back in. So continued growth out of KT. You love to see it. Sitting pretty still in that 18 spot is PSG Talon. We highlighted when they were going to get the big marquee matchup against CTB Flying Oyster, which they did. That is the Carsa Sword Art Squad and PSG get a clean 2-0 against them to move to 6-0. Still clearly looking like the best team coming out of the PCS. Always difficult to grade the minor region squads, but obviously they've gotten a little bit of a bump since they were able to take down FlyQuest at MSI, which is stuff we've alluded to. Still think the PCS is the premier B tier or tier 2 region. We'll see how things change in 2025 when all... These regions are amalgamating into one, a lot of them. Uh, but for now, stay in put harder. Although this is probably the closest uh, week to have them bumping up towards that top 15 category. Because ahead of PSG, you got a couple of tumbling LEC squads. And that are that is the two 8-1 and one squads from the regular season. Both BDS and SK. Big Falls. Not because they lost to Fnatic and G2, respectively. Sure, that is disappointing. But the fashion that they were losing these games and the fashion that at least BDS even qualified uh, to get to. These are some of the ugliest playoff games. You, can't, you wouldn't even think these are playoff games. The form that both SK and BDS were showing. 
Uh, Niski had some embarrassing moments against Fnatic. BDS had absolutely no business even getting to their matchup against G2 after Mad Lions were throwing a 10k gold lead. But you've seen all the reactions from all the big streamers that watch these games and they're left screaming. Cajal hates it. I will dominate not watching LEC anymore. It's been a surprisingly abysmal first week uh, of playoff action. We were expecting to level up from these squads that finished 8-1, and one, but it was yucky yucky. Looked like they were getting rid of the rust from an offseason. I get there was a week off for EWC, but just not in that world's form where pretty much anybody save for G2 this week in the LEC. So that obviously means a, a bunch of squads ahead of the LEC are going to be getting bumped up because both SK and BDS getting ousted from that top 10 category, slumping down to 16 and 17, respectively. A few spots ahead of them. Fnatic, at least, were winning these matchups, but even for them, an incredibly ugly series against Giant X, and because SK looks so bad, it makes Fnatic look better in that 2-0, so we're tentatively and you know being cautiously optimistic uh for fanatic getting a plus one i know noah is saying he thinks fanatic has a higher ceiling than g2 to which i would say huh have you seen the last year uh not quite i haven't seen that and g2 clearly still feels like the highest ceiling uh of at least eu maybe even in the west you could be talking about but fanatic still does get a bump up because sk and bds uh were so ugly that's why FlyQuest is also getting a tiny little bump up they didn't even play this week uh that's just more a result of these eu squads not looking very good uh, how about the debut or the return lng skyrocketing up because we haven't talked about them in two weeks obviously the bulk of this comes as the result of a not just series win but a two zero series win over top esports uh, to send them to zero and two and of course they already won a three game set against Weibo so scouting the boys looking like they're finding that mid playoff form as they sit atop the table they've only dropped that single game uh, so far to Weibo to sit three and zero overall and Weibo we were starting to get excited about LNG this is looking more like a team that was top four status throughout a lot of last year. This is a world's caliber, world's contending team, and we're seeing more and more signs of that out of them. So finally, they look dead in the water at times in this first round. Maybe Weibo and LNG just couldn't get acclimated to the fearless draft. I'm trying to give them the, some excuses for why they looked so lost up throughout the summer split early on, but bouncing back in an even bigger way for LNG. Again, if you drop this current form of LNG against the current form we just got in playoffs between BDS and SK, that's not close. Doesn't matter if it's a best of one, best of three, best of five. LNG are smoking the EU squads if they're playing at that level. So they chilling at that number 13 spot. Kwang Dong, a similar effect. They looked pretty Good, had a solid showing against DRX, but it's more the teams around them floundering a little bit. I'm still I'm still hesitant about Kwangong after that super hot start, but we have seen them play at least a competitive one game against the best of the best in Gen G in the LCK. So still very much a playoff caliber squad in the LCK trying to knock uh, on the door of the upper echelon top four LCK godfather so far. And... Then, finally, last one on this list. Much like FlyQuest getting a little bit of a bump with everybody sliding, Cloud9 also is the recipient of a tiny little bump, even though they have, again, had a relatively easy schedule so far, but they have put up some historically dominant numbers through the first three games, uh, first three series, excuse me, over in the LCS. But just need to see more out of them. Need to see them against stiffer competition in the LCS. And thankfully, games in North America will be back this weekend so we can touch on and talk about the squads as we get more time on the rift with the boys from NA rolling in to everybody's favorite top 10, the finale.
of the double digits. It is an LPL squad that we've been talking about a lot lately, climbing into the top 10 for the first time. Anyone's legend up three spots, even though they lost that hyped up head-to-head -head matchup against JDG. It was a banger of a series, absolutely back and forth throughout. They showed that they can go toe-to-toe -to -toe against JDG. Ole gave Sheer the rookie all that he could handle in that matchup. And honestly, Shanks outmatched Yigao pretty much across all three of those matchups. And even though Ruler had some highlight reel montage worthy plays, Hope and Kyle held their own against Ruler and Missing. So pretty much even though we're not calling it a red light or anything, it's a it's a just about the switch from green to yellow. We're not hesitating or peeling back on the hype for anyone's legend, uh, dropping that single series against JDG. They're still sitting pretty at three and one towards the top of that ascension table over in the LPL. And honestly, still, even with the resurging LNG, still feel like AL could be that fourth seed uh, out of the LPL when the World Championship qualifiers are rolling around. Thankfully for EU, the LEC, the region as a whole, as all these teams seem to be floundering, the level up, the build up for the defending back to back to back to back champions, G2 Esports, slowly coming online. We're getting wombo combos against K Corp. We're getting Broken Blade picking the spicy picks, even though he's going 0 and 3 on Jace to start things up against the Malphite, getting the Jace, getting the Aatrox bringing up uh, different avenues and play styles for G2 to be able to pull out. But they looked better in their two best ofs than they did through the majority of the regular season in summer. Even though they had a nice-looking 7-2 and two record, it was an underwhelming 7-2. and two, Especially by G2 standards, which are far and away the highest standards that we have in the LEC. But highlighting Zhao Hu being able to play some of these mid-lane uh, AD carries... Caps needs to have Tristana permabanned, as we talked about. The Lucian was an absolute treat. That might be the biggest mid lane individual advantage that we've seen the entire year in the LEC. My man was almost up like 4K plus just in the mid lane matchup in that Lucian game against BDS. So he has been absolutely maintaining that MVP claps level form uh, throughout well, the regular season, even when G2 was looking shaky and seems to be just at another level as we roll through the playoffs. So, feeling sus about everybody in EU that's not named G2, which unfortunately is painted a picture for another somewhat stale playoff run where G2 comes away with another title. But they're back in the top 10 either way in that 9 spot. Not enough to overtake Team Liquid uh, because, well, they didn't do anything right or wrong. They didn't play this week. Need to see more out of them, but they've been so dominant through their first three series. Had such a solid MSI showing that they're still chilling as that best team in the West for now. Unless, until G2 uh, continues an even more dominant playoff run or until we see some more series out of Team Liquid against some of the premier squads over in the LEC. D-plus and TES both bit of a reality check taken down a bit d plus listen they were so close against gen g close to at least taking a single game i, I think gen g at 99 times out of 100 would still have won game three even if d plus was able to force it but they showed they could compete they could test gen g on the rift and i'm still feeling very good about d plus they're really only getting bumped down because other squads had some nice showings and uh, well, you got squads like Top Esports kind of pushing them down because they have been struggling 0 and 2 uh, to start off this Rumble stage. And as you can see, the standings, how many games teams have played have become a bit of a mess at this point in the global rankings because these formats are at such different stages. EU has already played a full round and are into playoffs. There's only been three best ofs in the LCS. The record's kind of reset in the LPL, so it looks ridiculous having a 0-2 squad in the same category as somebody like D+, or G2 right now. But, of course, you're still kind of taking into account how the first round went for TES, where they were probably the most dominant-looking squad, even more so than BLG. They went to the finals at EWC, so 0-2 were by no means panicking 
for this start for Top Esports. They're going to have plenty of time to sort this one out. And of course, one of those matchups was a hyper-competitive three-game set against BLG, where honestly came down to a couple of team fights. BLG ends up outclassing them in those fights and other loss to not the slumping, yucky, garbage, bottom feeder LNG that we saw in the first round. They've started to level up. So yes, TES gets punished by getting bumped out of the top five for the first time in what feels like all of 2024, basically. But no reason to panic or believe that they can't get back in to that top five VIP lounge with the rest of the big boys. Speaking of the lounge, we've got some new entries in and a couple of squads that are just hovering just hanging on to where uh they've been in the past starting with both jdg hovering in that five spot they get the win against anyone's legend but still not dominant in their wins whether it's against anyone's legend or sometimes even the bottom team so the record the numbers all look decent overall for JDG, but six and four, they're still only at a, a plus two overall game score, which is actually lower than squads below them in the standings. So a lot of the time needing game threes to close things out or not closing out their actual wins in the most convincing fashion. Still some shakiness. Yagao hasn't been great the last couple of weeks. Still a top five caliber team, but kind of on the lower end of those top five. And Top Esports, D plus Kia are both hovering, breathing down their neck and shoulder, waiting to usurp their throne or their spot in that top five area. T1 still holding on to that four spot, but as you can see, the big climb into this top five this week is the debut in the VIP lounge for Mr. Hanwa Life Viper. No stranger to being in this list, as well as the rest of the Gen G boys in Peanut, Delight, and Doran. But obviously, mainly riding the high of that series win against T1. And it felt right to have them back-to-back -back in these standings, because obviously T1 is winning Game 3 up until the very last team fight. And honestly, both games 1 and 2 probably could have gone either way. So a super hyper competitive series between these two squads but it is Hanwa who comes away with it and now they're sitting pretty in second place in the LCK they've got the best game score and obviously a win against T1 now to their name they followed that up with a incredibly dominant win against Fox uh, or BNK, BNK Fear X I should say it wasn't even close uh, and looked like they weren't belonging to the same league so Hanwa after that Really only first week where they dropped the game to D+. Plus. You were like, what the heck was that performance? They have been absolutely lethal since then. Doran continues to be the Grim Reaper when it comes to a T1 matchup. Viper, I mean, you might be putting him number one ADC in the LCK right now. Ahead of Kuma, ahead of Pace. Those are probably the main guys you're talking about. But Viper has been absolutely deadly. Zekka seems like a pretty good meta for him. Uh, I know... Yone, always a good fallback pick for him. I know we normally associate him with the melee assassins, but he's looked pretty good in more of these ranged matchups that we're seeing in this 80 carry centric mid lane meta. And Peanut continues to be the general that Hanwa and the rest of the boys all deserve. So we're feeling very good about what Hanwa Life is putting on the riff right now and rewarding them with a bump into not just top five, but top three status. Uh, combined with the get TES slump and JDG looking fine and winning the head-to-head -head against T1 is enough for them to get bumped up to three. There's still nobody sniffing the category or the level that the top two on these lists are. I don't see how either of these guys get knocked out of their respective spots. BLG already alluded to that head-to-head -head win against TES. Turns out their results at the EWC were a complete overreaction as they lost to T1. They followed that up with a pretty solid showing um, against LGD to go 2-0 against them. And I think it's back-to-back -back series now. You're talking about Jun stepping up. So 
The signing of Way immediately paying dividends and Way hasn't even had to hit the rift yet for BLG because it feels like Jun has played so much better over the past couple of series. Whether or not that's the signing kind of lighting a fire under him to get back to his solid form and listen... For a full year plus, we were talking about him kind of right there alongside Kanavi as the two best junglers in the LPL, and he's not at that form yet. We're not ready to reward him with that, but he's looked much better over the last couple of games, and when he's playing like that, that's when BLG is truly terrifying. So they are sitting pretty locked and loaded, comfy in the lazy boy, second best lounge in the this uh, top five area, but we know that Gen G are the ones on the rooftop patio. They've got the the second floor balcony. They got multiple rooms that are booked out under their name, and ain't nobody else allowed to be there. Even if the boys aren't there, it's booked out, and nobody else can share it because obviously we've alluded to how insane the numbers are for Gen G. How about rocking over a 2.1 team KDA? almost halfway through the LCK regular season. That is absolutely nutty and substantially higher than the second best um, in the LCK. Less than eight deaths per game and less than two towers given up. Again, per game on average. Those numbers are absolutely insane. 16-0 uh, and 0 game score overall. Even, it, it's so difficult. It felt like that D-plus series... D-Plus was doing everything right, even in the game where there's the miraculous 5v3 Joby Beautiful Shuffle. It felt like D-Plus should have had a bigger lead going into that Baron fight because they were doing everything right. They were racking up kills. They were in control, and it was something like a 2, 3k gold lead. Gen G just... It's not just Chovy that doesn't miss CS. They're just both keen and pays all the carries on Gen G seems to be always in the right spot to be picking up every possible bit of gold that they can and just milk the rift for every tiny bit of coin that they can get even when the other team is in control they're still picking up money almost a 3k 2700 gold differential at 15 is absolutely insane nobody's touching them in summer it feels like unless the meta changes and breaks everything for gen g they are the team to beat not just in the lck but worldwide and will be probably until the international events roll around but that is it today for League Unluck, my name is Eric, and thank you to all you lovely individuals for hanging out. As always, and we'll catch you on the flippity flip.